I'll stay, I'll stay still. <laughs> well, I, can, I can do that. My friend Gavin Yuko loves the Eurovision Song Contest. Okay, he watches it every year. And he loves the Israeli entry, right? And um, he, he always thought that the national anthem shouldn't be Hatikva because it's too boring, right? And he thought it should be based on a song that happened at the Eurovision Song Contest. You imagine in the Olympic Games that Israel finally wins something, you know, wrestling, and they get up, and instead of Kolod, it would be Hallelujah. And <laughs> the whole audience would start going like this, and it would be a real Kiddush Hashem. And he wrote to the ambassador saying, Let, this is in early in 1998, actually, can we make it officially Hallelujah? But they went for Hatikba instead, so otherwise it would be a very different shield tonight. <laughs> so, it only became in 2004, which is interesting, okay? So it wasn't official, like all the best things. They just happen, and then afterwards they get sanctioned. So who was Natalia Hertz Imba? Born in 1956 in Ukraine, traditional Jewish education, and he moved to Israel in 1882. Um, he was working as a secretary for a Christian Zionist, Olifant, and ended up in Haifa. In 1887, he returned to Europe and lived in London, and then he traveled to India and eventually went <coughs> to America in 1892. Right? He was a, quite a vulgar, sarcastic person, right? And he died penniless in New York City in 1909 from the effects of chronic, that means a lot, right? <laughs> Alcoholism, right? But they all loved him, the community, right? And he'd arranged, he arranged for his burial because he'd written a poem, and for that poem, they bought it, that he got a burial place. But eventually, he was moved to Israel in 1953 and put in Har Menuchot. You know Har Menuchot, the one which is stack, yeah. the stacking, yeah. the stacking cemetery, so you can visit him. So, not a very religious man, although brought up knowing his Tanakh and Talmud, wrote this poem about the Shishuv, Petach Tikva. It got shortened and eventually became the national anthem. But as I'll show you, he knew his Tanakh. So if you look at the back of the handout, the very back, this is the original version. Thank God we don't sing this at the end of every simcha. Because we add another 10 minutes, right? But let's analyze a, a poem, right? This is a, a poem from 18, the late 1800s. Okay, so it's like a, a contemporary of Hirsch, but very, very different. Right, very different. But we have to understand that our texts, especially the modern texts, the religious texts, Anyone who knows their Hebrew is doing an interpretation of Tanakh. And we have to understand what Imba was saying, and if we like it or we don't like it, and analyze where he's coming from. Any questions at this point? No. Should I speak faster? No, it's okay. <laughs> Slower? Okay. So, Aviva, you're back. <laughs> So long as in the heart within a Jewish soul cannot find rest, and Jewish glances turn east to Zion fondly dart. Okay. Oh, have you got the same version? Have you got the same words? Yeah. Good. Yes, because I. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, Sion, by the way, is another word. Well, Sion is used a number of times in Tanakh. What is, what's the difference between Sion, Yisrael, and Yerushalayim? It's a hill in Jerusalem. Right, so traditionally Tzion was actually the place of Yerushalayim, but it came to mean Israel as a whole. It came to mean that. Originally it was just one particular, but it was when we talked about Shivat Tzion, it's not talking about just that hill, it's talking about the land of Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the um, uh, Yes. It's the one who made Tzion the symbol. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what's interesting is, well, we might get to Tzionim later on, what it stands for, okay? So, because it's used di in different ways in Tanakh. Now, so we have that first stage. Next, now the chorus. Our hope is not yet lost, the ancient hope to return to the land of our fathers, the city where David encamped. So you can see they've changed the end, right? Mm -hmm. that, the original was this, and they did Eretz Sion Yerushalayim. There's no Shanot Al Payim. There's no 2,000 years. That's later. Originally, it's to return to the land of our Avotenu. Eretz Avotenu is a classic phrase. It doesn't just mean our ancestors. It means Avot Yitzhak and Yaakov, right? Mm -hmm. Le'ir ba David Chana, that David 
camped there when he first came, right? So it said, so the first paragraph is, as long as we still look towards Israel, then Odla Avda Tikvatenu, our hope is not lost, right? And it's an ancient hope to come back to where David was originally. So he's being more historical. He's giving historical context. Let's look at the next verse. So long as tears from our eyes flow like benevolent rain and throngs of our countrymen still visit the graves of our forefathers. Then, Odla Avda Tikvatenu, you do the chorus. Then our hope is not lost. Can you see how it works now? Each paragraph is, as long as this, Odla Avda Tikvatenu. As long as this, Odla Avda Tikvatenu. If this happens, then our hope isn't lost. And he's going to give nine different examples of what it is. So what's this next verse about? Right? As long as the tears of our eyes flow like rain, the davot, or avot v'nei amenu, our countrymen, we still go to kivrei avot, kivrei avot, the graves of our forefathers. That's a tradition. Not to just to visit your own family, but to go to the, to, to go to the graves of famous rabbis and important ancestors. This is very Jewish. This is very traditional. This is in Hebron. Pardon? Hebron. Well, he, he is, he's in Israel. It would be hard in 1900 to get to Hebron, but it could be Kivriyav, absolutely. It wasn't as organized there, right? But it's in Harzatim as well. Right? Kivriyav, in general. Okay. What would be the modern word for throngs? Pardon? The modern word for throngs. Oh, throngs. Uh, many. Revavot uh, is myriads, thousands. Like full. Right, Elephant River Vot. Right? As long as, in other words, because if you visit your ancestors, you remember your tradition. So it's very traditional, this. Right? The new version hasn't got anything about us except for our desire for Israel. But there's no ideology in the new Hatikva except coming back. Right? Come this back. Phrase, no. For a what? A lot of people would like to see this. When you say a lot of people, who do you mean? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I, it's for me not so important to, uh, to have in the Hatikva to visit the, the graves of the Abu. True, but it, it's not just the literal meaning, it's what it stands for. So if you visit your ancestors, it means you still care about them. They're part of who you are. And in that sense, we do that. Right? So in the modern Hatikva, there is no ideology at all, right? We haven't forgotten to go back to the land. So to do what? In order that we will what? You know, there's always got to be a plan. Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the famous phrase in England, in English, is um, let my people go. Shalach etami. That phrase, shalach etami, occurs seven times in Shabbat, and there's always another word after it. Shalach etami v'yamaduni. Let my people go so that they can serve me. It's not freedom from, it's freedom to. There's a plan. Of course you need to be free. That's stage one. But there must be a stage two. And the modern Hatikva doesn't have stage two. But Imba, a secular, alcoholic Zionist, did. <laughs> Bring back the alcoholic, secular Zionists, is what I said. <laughs> do, do you understand what I mean? He had passion. He had passion. Right? So, that's the Kiveh Avot, absolutely. Um, and again, I'll just mention a quick story. I was in Shirat HaKotel, and before Shoshana, it's a tradition to visit the graves of the Gadolim in Hazetim. I was in the old city, so you go to Mount of Olives and you visit the grave rabbis. But if from HaKotel, this was in 1987, there were two coaches. One went to Hazetim to visit the Gadolim, and one went to HaHertzel. And the Rosh Yeshiva didn't go to Hazetim, he went to Har Herzl, where all the soldiers are buried. And he was, Rav Hadari, he was in his 60s by then already, okay? And he found it hard to walk, but he knew where was buried every one of the soldiers, the boys who'd been in his Yeshiva who died. And he went, I was only 18, it had a big impression on me, he walked to everyone and said to him, and every, to Hemat Sadikim, to see a man with a, you know, dressed, Haredi dressed, to visit everyone, and I could see the weight, they were his responsibility, it was very powerful. So that's also 
שבעי אבות. Next verse. כל עוד חומת מחמדנו לעינינו מופעת ועל חורבן מקדשנו עין אחת עוד דומה. So long as our precious wall appears before our eyes and over the destruction of our temple an eye still wells up with tears. Right, then, Odlo Abda Tikvatenen, that I hope is not lost. So what's it talking about here? It actually says, Choban Mikdashenu. It's got the word Kadosh, that attempts to make the modern Hatikva, right? Leod Amkochi, which people think is modern, actually is in the original. He's not afraid to say holy. There was a time where people could use the word holy and not be embarrassed to say it, okay? To talk about the temple being destroyed, because that was the end of the state of Israel. I, I, when I teach young people, I say, we are now in the third state of Israel. The first state ended in 586 BCE. The second state ended in 70 CE, right? And we're now in the third state of Israel. And please God, it will last. But it's still very young. The first state lasted from about 11th century BCE to 586, so that's about um, six, 600 years. The second one, 512 to 70, about 700 years. And the third one, 70. It's young, right? It's new, but it's the third attempt to stay. We're more used to being outside than inside. Right? We spent more of Jewish history and more great Jewish books were written outside of Israel than inside. So it's new for us. But the Chorban was the destruction. And again, the the, the, uh, the tears. Again, he sees this flow of tears mm. as important. Mm. So I want, to, I want to highlight that to you. It's quite agricultural. It's the liquid aspect of it, this flow. You'll see, it comes later on. Um, when you analyze Hebrew, it's poetry as well. It's like when, when you try to teach Siddur to young children today, it's so hard. It's not just another language, it's poetry. And if they're not used to doing poetry, they find it hard. That's why I think every person should study poetry in their own language. Otherwise, they won't understand the, t t t the, uh, the davening to fill up. Because it's all very playful. If you don't have an ear for poetry, then you can't follow a lot of Hebrew because it's not just another language, it's another style of expression. And is the, the wall, is it meant like the Western wall or is it? Yes, common, yes, absolutely. Because in, it was there, it was, there was a lot of rubbish in front of it, but they still, there was that last wall that was left. They knew about that. There were excavations. We know that in England, the, uh, the you might have been to the British Museum, but there's the Palestine Exploration Fund, the PEF. It's the oldest archaeological excavations. You know Robinson's Arch? It's Robinson. Yeah. He's the British guy that they dug. And it's in London today, and a lot of digs in Israel are based on the research that they did. Right? And that was done very early on in these times. So they knew about all, absolutely. So that's about, as long as we still remember the structure of the temple, there's hope. But there's literally a Gemara that says that, if you know, the Talmud that says, one who cries and remembers the destruction of the temple will be Zocher, will merit to be there when it is returned. But if you don't cry, you won't. Right? If you don't care about the loss, then you can't be part of the game. That's, that's part of it. Imba's not religious, but he feels that. Obviously, you have to care. Let's go on. Next verse. <laughs> <laughs> so long as Jordan's waters powerfully fill its banks, and toward the Sea of Galilee, its waters <coughs> noisily fall. Then, Odla Avda Tikvatein. As long as there is water in the Jordan, and water in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Kinneret. And you know, every day in Israel, they announce the height of the Kinneret, because water is so important in Israel. When I was living there in 2004, Olmet, I can say this about him because he's in prison, so I can say this. About him. <laughs> um, they didn't like him when he was a uh, mayor of Jerusalem, right? And he spent a lot of time around the world visiting communities and not being the mayor of Jerusalem. So they'd say, the height of the Kinneret is this, and Olmet has been out of Israel for this many days. <laughs> Every day they do the next day, and I'll be being out of the country. I, I don't like talking bad about somebody, but he's in prison, so <laughs> I never trust him. But um, anyway, he's a difficult man, for sure. He did some good things, but he did some bad things. He'll pay, he'll come out, Shuvah Gamura, be okay. But at the moment, he's in prison. So, uh, yes, so notice the water again, the flow. He's a poet, so the tears are flowing, and now you've got the, in other words, if we cry, 
Because liquid is about life. Water is life. So the tears, our tears, show that we still care we're alive. And then if the waters of the land of Israel still flow, then it's still alive. Can you see? The imagery is, is very natural. And it's important to appreciate those ideas. It's got to be fresh. Right? <coughs> it's got to be fresh. Um, it's also quite, always, we got hope. It's yes? also quite interesting that they, it's not mentioned that, uh, that it also flows into the Dead Sea, meaning yes, it's yes, because it's exactly. part of the Jordan. Yes, because it wants to be alive, a flowing part mm -hmm. of the Jordan, exactly, which you live by, absolutely. So he'd, been, he'd seen these things, right? So he's seeing Israel and expressing it in this way. Next, Kol Od. Kol Od shama ale drachim verachaim sha'ar yukat shi'iya uben chormot Yerushalayim od bat siyon bochia. So long as the city gates, humiliated, dot the barren highways, and among the ruins of Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion still cries. Then, Odlo Avdatik Vatenu, it's not over. Now this, anyone know what, what he's referring to? The gates are barren highways? What's he, which, which, which sefer of the, of the Tanakh is he referring to? Echa, excellent. This is the beginning of Echa. Echa said, he writes Jeremiah at the beginning, I'm standing at Jerusalem, right? And no one comes. He's referring to the Moadim. Three times a year, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, we all came to Jerusalem. That was the image you would feel. You would stand at the gates and see thousands coming from all directions. It was the Chag, or as the Muslim Muslims call it, the Hajj. It's the same word. The Hajj, when they visit Mecca, is our copy of our the Chag. It's the same word. That's what it is. So they would come, and he stands at the gates, and no one turns up. Right? It's a shocking image at the beginning of Echa, and he's saying, right? Right? He's saying, as long as it cries, then, but then he says, so it's sad that's happened, but as long as we cry for that, he's basically saying, Tisha B'Av. Yeah. Right? If we still cry on Tisha B'Av, then it's not over yet. If we still care about the loss of Rishonai. <laughs> and I teach, it's interesting, I'm sure here as well, less religious Jews don't do Tisha B'Av. And I was sitting with a whole bunch of uh, gentlemen in, in St. John's Wood, I teach, and they're not so religious, and they do Shabbat, they come on Shabbat, Shabbat morning, and they, they do Pesach Shabbat Sukkot, but Tishbat they don't do so much, they're not so, and I, but they're strong Zionists, and, and I was talking about Tishbat, and they say, well, we don't really go on Tishbat, and I said, forget religion, forget religion, if you're a Zionist, you have to do something on Tishbat, because Tishbat was the destruction of the Jewish people, it was the end, it was the end of the state of Israel, it's a national holiday, as religious people, we express it through davening. But if you want to express it by reading a book and sitting and the, read Josephus and what happened, do that. But you can't do nothing. And, and I realized this, because the religious remembered it, people thought it belonged to the religious. And it belongs to the nation. Right? Tisha B'Av should be a day of mourning in Israel. Nothing to do with religion. Also, but it doesn't have to connect. We've, we've missed the point. It's cultural. So he and Imba could see that. So next one. So long as pure tears flow from the eye of our dear nation, mourning for Zion at the peak of evening, she still rises at midnight. Right? Then Orla of Datikvatenu, it's not over. Again, with the tears and the flowing, he's got this flowing. We had flowing rivers, Nozalot, right? And now, now we have flowing of the, uh, of, the, of the eye of our dear nation, right? Now, what's he talking about here, right? Livkot Sion Bachatzot Bachatzianelot. What's he talking about? On? He's talking, I think, about Tikkun Tikkun Chatzot. Right, there was a tradition at, at midnight. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. We're learning Hatikva. There you go. Thank you. There was a, a, there was a, yes. There was a tradition to learn to, to a le very late at night at the Kotel to go there and to say prayers for Jerusalem being rebuilt. Have you ever been to the Kotel at midnight? Yeah. So I went to, I used to go to Kotel at midnight. You meet very interesting people at midnight at the Kotel. One guy comes up to me and he says, I know you. I was like, no, you really don't. He goes, met. I, I recognize you. I said, where from? He goes, Sinai. 
<laughs> now it's side eye. Right. So, okay. <laughs> it's very polite. Anyway, so, um, so, but he says if you still get up in the middle of the night, if you care enough to not sleep because you want to build again, then Hodla have that And the next and the next one, let's keep going. Okay, this is a very complicated one. Go on, English. So long as blood drips in our veins, flowing back and forth, and upon the graves of our fathers, wisps of dew still fall. Okay, now he's got he's there's there's a uh, two two examples of a liquid going on here merging together. Can you see? We've had the tears of our ancestors, right? And now we have the tears, we have the blood flowing in our veins. And now we have the dew on the graves. It's not our crying on the graves, but the dew of nature rebirthing on the graves. You'll see why this is all relevant, where he got it from, right? But the imagery is very powerful. Pardon? Well, because it sounds so, what, but, 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 uh, blood, sweat, toil, and tears. Yes, yes. Well, well when I finished my smicha, I, we, we graduated, I spoke on behalf of the students, and I said smicha is blood, sweat, toil, and tears, because you learn all about blood um, in smicha. And we could do many stuff. Anyway, yes, absolutely. So, but what's interesting, by the way, these phrases, right? The, the, the blood in our veins, and then, Rutsor v'shov yilozu, flowing Rutsor v'shov. Anyone know what the Tzor Veshov is all about? Any Hasidim here? No. Hasidut? <laughs> so we, it's the problem, we all get yeah. different kind of yeah. like Haveli or modern Orthodox or yeah. Hasidish or, or, or <coughs> Sioni, we need to be everything. What Tzor Veshov is a very important idea in Hasidut. It's, well, it, it's in the first of all, the Chazon Yechezkiel. Absolutely, it's chapter one of Yechezkiel. And uh, the Kabbalistin made something about it and the Hasidim took it. Yes. So what service shop means to go forward and back. So in Ezekiel chapter 1, the, the two most dangerous chapters in the Bible are Genesis chapter 1, Reshit Perekalaf, and Yechezkel Perekalaf. You're not supposed to read them. They have government health warnings on them. <laughs> right? You shouldn't read it. Right? If you look at the article, it says if you read this, you mustn't draw it. As, as it, chapter 1 of Reshit is very complicated, and Ezekiel chapter 1 is this amazing vision of a chariot with four heads, and the article says you mustn't draw it. If you do, you'll be destroyed. I drew it. <laughs> I'm a very bad artist because I'm still here, <laughs> clearly. Um, but it's, and, and, my, and, and the Gemara says these are Marseille Bereshit, Marseille Merkava, mystical texts. Very interesting what they're really about. But in that text, it talks about sparks flying backwards and forwards. And the Hasidim use this as a metaphor for our relationship with God. Because the Gemara and the Rambam always talked about the hierarchy. God is here, we're here, and there's different levels. But it's very much descriptive. It's static. This is here, this is here. The Hasidim said, you've got to go up and down. You've got to move up the ladder. And in relationships, you can never just go to God. Now, you've all got relationships with your partner or your children or your parents. There are good days and there are bad days. There are close days and they're far away. And that's normal. What Suri Vishov, going close and going away again, is what a relationship is. Well, you can draw a graph of your relationship, it goes up and down, right? That's real. So the same with God. And that's what the Hasidim say. What Soi Veshov is their description of your <coughs> ongoing emotional relationship with God. But he, and he knew that. Imba would have known that. But he's using it in a different kind of way. He's saying it's not about God. It's about us, the blood flowing in our veins, if we're still alive, if we're still fresh. Okay? Let's go to the next one, number nine, number eight. So long as deep national love beats in the heart of the Jew, we can hope even today that a zealous God will grant us mercy. And then hope is not lost. What's amazing that's in here? God. God. He mentions God. Now, El is the old name for God. Chapter 12 in Bereshit, right? Bet El, that's the, the old name that was used for God in the, in the land of Israel, one of the oldest names. So he's using a kind of more universal name, as opposed to Yudke Vavke or, 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 or Adonai. But Kel Zo, El Zoem is a phrase from Tehillim. 
It's chapter 7 of Tehillim, El Zoen, right? Talks about um, a, a zealous God who attacks, the Rashi says, attacks the wicked. He's zealous to attack the wicked. But here he's saying, a ze- the zealous God who's, a, who's horrible to the wicked will give Rachamim to us. That's very traditional and Jewish. Hashem punishing the wicked, being merciful. He's, he's not afraid to put it in. Right? And finally, the last verse. <coughs> this says it really clearly. Listen, my brothers in the land of exile, to the words of one of our visionaries, that only with the last Jew lies also the end of our hope. Rakim acharon ha-Yehudi, with the last Jew, gam acharit tikvatenu, is the end of our hope. So what's Chabad? What? It was Chabad. Well, before Chabad, <laughs> right? Well, not before the Chabad, but Chabad, modern Chabad. It's amazing, he's saying. Right, as long as there's someone left, right? Hirsch said it as well. The, uh, the, uh, the path of truth does not count the number of its adherents, of its followers. Right? Same kind of idea. But what's he talking about? My, he says, Shimu Achai, my brothers, but Atsot Nudi. What's he referring to there? Atsot Nudi. Anybody know? In the lands of exile, Nudi is exile. That's, uh, that should be um, Atsot uh, galu, uh, Galut. What's Nudi? Nudi. Excellent. Excellent. Navaned. Yeah. Right? What's that referring to? Kain. 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 Right? Kain was exiled to what to be a wanderer. Right? In, in the land. And never to be have a home. So he's saying, all of you people are like Kain. He's been condemning them. Right? And saying, you've got to come back. Right? And you mustn't give up on this issue. Right? Navaned is a key issue. Right? In modern Hebrew, what's a Nadned? In modern Hebrew. It's a seesaw. Okay. Nadneda. So the phrases come through. By the way, um, there's even, do you know the kids' song? The, the kids' song? Nadned? Oh. I don't know why the lights are. So do we have to wave our arms about to make it come on again? We have to push a button somewhere. By the way, do you know who? So this song Nad Ned, Ned Ale Ale Vared, Ronak Sizor, Go Up, Go Down, Mala 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 Mata, What's Up, What's Below, Raka Nia Niva Atta, Just Me and You. Do you know who wrote that? Bialik. Why? What is Bialik, a great secular poet, doing writing Nad Ned? Because it's a secular response to the Gemara. The Gemara says in Chagiga, Mala 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 Mata, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Haaretz Shebonei Hakadosh Baruch Hu. God is above you, and the earth that God created is below you. But Bialik says, Mala 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 Mata. What's above? What's below? Rock Ani Ani Vata. Just me and you. No God. If you want to teach a new ideology, write nursery rhymes <laughs> because they get into the culture. So there was a, a very clear. Fight, ideologically. The irony today is that secular Israelis don't even know that it was an attack because they don't know the Gemara and they don't know Bialik. And Dutty people also don't know and sing the song as well because they don't know. So it's all fine today. We've forgotten the arguments. But you have, you have to be educated enough to be Chiloni, to be properly Chiloni. You have to know your Tanakh. So I think, in a way, they're more Dutty. <coughs> The rib- anyway, it's a big circle. You see what you see where I'm going, right? So ju- what, just with the last Jew, then the hope ends, and then he says, "Odd lot of that tikvatein." So now you can see why the theme is tikvatein. Odd lot. That's the key line. Now, where did he get it from? What was he basing on? We've shown you that he was quoting from Eicha and Tehillim and Yechezkel all over. It's natural if you know your Tanakh, you can't help. Bring it alive. Just like English people quote Shakespeare, right? And Russians quote Russian literature. And Swiss people quote. (laughs) 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 Quote quote the commission for discussing quotes. Do you know what I mean? Have a. No? Surely something? (laughs) You'll tell me. But the point is, it's part of your. who you are. 
So, I'm going to show you that Imba clearly, it, this is a, 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 a perush. This is a commentary on the Tanakh. And it's clearly a commentary on chapter 37 of Yechezkel. Right? So turn to page 2. The Valley of Dry Bones. You all know that story? The dry bones. Then bones, then bones, then dry bones. This is, this is the story. We read it, you know it's Shabbat. We read it on the, the Haftorah of Shabbat Cholomoy Pesach. We just read it. Yeah. Okay? And Shabbat Cholomoy is all about vision. There are two Shabbat Cholomoyites, of Pesach and of Sukkot. And in Sukkot we read about Gog and Magog, which is also about the end of days and the return to Israel. So they're visionary. Shabbat and the Chagim are overlapping, and we think about the future. This chapter, as you will see, is clearly what Imber based it on. We're going to read through this text. Now, you've all heard of it, the dry bones coming back to life. But only when you read the text do you really see what he's saying. So I want to read it very slowly with you, this text. All of Jewish learning is about reading slowly. It's not about Greek, like Homer and Iliad. There's many versions of those things. It doesn't matter which version. You can play and tell the story differently. But in Tanakh, you have to read the original words. The story has to be told with these words. And then you understand it. So let's see this story. Yechezkel is a prophet, as you know, the time of the destruction of the first temple. And he's thinking about the future. And God gives him a vision. So, ah, this time, Rene, do you want to do our, our Yechezkel? <laughs> Okay, now can I have another, another reader? I want to hear it to do? Do you want to do it in English? Do you want to do it? Go on. The hand of God was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of God and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Okay, so he's, he's in Israel at this point and he's taken by God, right, into a valley, a bikar, full of bones. Did this literally happen? What do you think? It's a dream. What implies in the first verse that you can't take it literally? Right? Yad Hashem, the hand of God. Does God have a hand? Do you think? No. Do you, do you think God has a hand? Yad Hashem. Do you think God has a hand? Literally, no. 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 Yes and no. Do you think it's literal God's got a hand? No. No. That's not literal. Exactly. So if the yad is not literal, why do you think anything else in the verse is literal? So I'm showing you. Well, the yad chazaka is to do with Egypt. We only get the phrase yad chazaka or zonu to yah for, for Mitzrayim. When Hashem attacks um, uh, Bavel, we don't get it. When he attacks Paras, Persia, we don't get it. With Assyria, we don't get it. Even with the Greeks, we don't get it. Only with Egypt. Yad Chazaka was one to Yad. Why? Well, it's very obvious when you visit the British Museum. All the big statues have the Pharaoh standing like this, with a document showing his power. Right? And in the British Museum, there's one. Literally, the arm is, is, is there in the museum. It goes from there to there, and it's that thick of stone. It's a Yad Chazaka was one to Yad. And the Tanakh, the Torah was written, for us to understand. And if you were a Canaanite slave in Egypt in 13th century BCE, right, then the mighty hand was Pharaoh. Just like the Iron Curtain is Russia, and the Iron Lady is Thatcher, <laughs> right, and the boss is Bruce Springsteen, right, and the king is Elvis Presley, the, uh, the mighty hand was, was Egypt. So the Torah says God is the real power. He will bring you out with Yad Chazaka Zon to Yad. It's a response to Egyptian culture. You see? There's lots of examples, but <coughs> I'll come Pesach time, I'll tell you about it. It's a whole other story. We'll come to London, I'll show you around the museum. If you want to come on a trip, well, we can do it. Anyway, so, it's, it's not literal, we can see here. And he puts him in this valley full of bones. Right? Carry on. Next pass <laughs> Okay. And caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Okay, you can see the stress, right? There were lots of them, 
and they were very dry. Ma'od, ma'od, right? There were definitely many, Ma'od, ma'od, and Yveshot, ma'od, very dry. It's very important that he sees this image and describes it. Carry on. And God said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Right. Why did he just say, can? Mm. Yes. <laughs> All right. What does it mean, you know? What's good? It's really weird. Right? It sounds to me like a magician. You know a magician says, can I have a volunteer from the audience? Can you see this box? Is it empty? Are you sure? Please check. Is it completely empty? <laughs> and then suddenly a rabbit says, these bones, are they dry? Check them. Are they really, really dry? They're very, very dry. Completely? Yes. Do you think they can come alive? I should say no. So, but Yecheskel's smart. He goes, he figures there's something going on. He goes, I'll tell data. You know. All right? What? Abracadabra. Abracadabra. What about Hocus Pocus? Hocus Pocus. It's Latin. It's interesting, these origins. But Abracadabra is not anywhere in the Kabbalah, by the way. It's, it works, but we never use that phrase. Okay. It's interesting to know. Anyway, don't, don't worry about that. But the point here is he's showing them something, and an image is very important. It's not just a, he's going to give a message, but the images are very important. For the prophets, the images were everything. They were movies. They brought things to life, and you didn't forget it because you had an image in your head. That's what they wanted to do, to plant an image in your head of these dry bones. And it's huge, by the way. Saviv, Saviv, he's flying. I imagine he's kind of flying all around. He's being taken to see this huge valley of bones. It's a great, powerful image, right? Um, and normally, this is a sign of great violence. I love movies. If you hear my show, I often quote movies. And in great movies, there's always that shocking moment where they turn, you think the guy's a good guy, and you turn a corner, there's a big valley of dry bones, and you realize they're a bad guy. I mean, literally in the cinema now, right? Just come out now. Um, God is the galaxy. There's a scene like that. I'm sitting there going, dry bones. Right there. Right? Biggest film out at the moment. And every so often in the cinema, you see a great, a great valley of bones. Okay. So, what happens? Next, by your man. Again, God said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of God. Okay, that's crazy. Now, prophets mostly fail. Right? No one listens to them. Right? They fail. Jeremiah, Yechizkel. Who was the most successful prophet? Moshe. Well, Moshe was a prophet, quite successful, but they moaned a lot to him as well. This prophet, he just said a few words and the whole world changed. Yonah. Right? You have sinned. They completely changed. And he didn't want to be a prophet. Right? But the others went on, even Moshe went on and on and on, they didn't listen to him. Right? And Moshe said, as soon as I die, I know you're not listening to me anymore. You won't listen to Yoshua. Not because right? Jonah prophesied to Goyim. Yeah, could be. Could be. <laughs> could be. That's a nice dig at ourselves. Yes. Um, uh, so it's, it's about being shamed. I knew one rabbi who said, I don't care what part of the Jewish people you're part of, as long as you're ashamed of it. <laughs> right? So, it's a great line. Anyway, so, um, yes. So, a prophet, the biggest challenge is to convince people. And most prophets, that was the hard bit. When God appeared to them, they said, no one's going to listen. Moshe said, no one's going to listen. Why choose me? Right? Now, this is the ultimate. God goes, I want you to prophesy to them. He goes, but they're not even alive. I don't, I don't have a chance. I don't have a standing chance. They're not even alive. They're really dead. They're not a bit dead. They're not recently dead. They're totally dead. This is, if you know Monty Python... This is the dead parrot sketch. It's completely dead. There is no life in these bones. But I'm being playful because imagery, because that's what Tanakh is. Tanakh is a comedy, it's a movie, it's totally alive. Once you get inside it, that's what it is. So I'm trying to loosen up the seriousness to, to, to make it real for you, right? It's just as alive as any movie that I see. Okay, so he says that, okay, um, and he says, I want you to listen to me, you bones. So that's how mad this is. It's like when the angels appear to Abraham and they say, you're going to have a child. And what did Sarah do? 
She laughed. Right? Because right? she never would. Right? God does the impossible. So let's keep going. Next verse. Karma. Thus says the Lord God to these bones Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Okay, now remember, this is, this is not what he's saying yet. God is telling him to say this on behalf of God. Right? He's going to say to him, to, 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 you've got to say to them that the, the life will come into you and you'll live. What does that remind you, by the way? Of the, the spirit will come in and they'll live. Bereshit. That's what happened in Bereshit. God breathed in to man, right? By pach ba'apav, ruach neshama. Right? God, God breathed life into him. Right? God breathed into Adam's nostrils. By the way, do you think God has a mouth? No. So when it said God breathed in, do you think it's literal? No. How long do you think it took? One second? Two minutes? Five million years? <laughs> Right? It's crazy to read these purely literally because they're clearly not. Right? This could be a, a way of describing that. And what about the second example in Tanakh? Thought you had like the prophet which is going back to the new child which is dead and now. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's another issue of coming. So Nisha does it. We can add up, we can get to it. We'll look at the Rambam and see. I'll come back another time and tell you, but we have to work out verse by verse. But each one is interesting. Okay? Uh, good, yes, next one. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you. Sinews is like uh, the beginnings of limbs, you know, the beginning of the, of the blood. Tendons. Right, tendons, yeah. Mm -hmm. And cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am God. Okay, so it's not just that you're alive. Remember, you're not just free, but alive to know God. Know God is consciousness. It's the last level. You're not just alive. But you have. Do, do animals know God? Right? They don't have a consciousness like we have a consciousness. It's very different. Pardon? We do, you know, we do know a bit. There's a great book, if you want to read, by Raymond Tallis called Michelangelo's Finger. You know? Right? Yeah. It, and the whole book, it's a philosophy book, it's about pointing. It's a point. The whole book is about pointing. 150 pages about pointing. Only humans point. If I go like that, you will follow my pointing and look at the clock. If you go like that to a dog, you look at your finger. <laughs> right? And it's interesting, there's a different level of consciousness. Right? Do not send animals. Now, Darwin, I'm a big fan of Darwin, argued it's just a, a, a level of degree, right? But we think it's a, an order of kind, but there's a different consciousness. I think we evolved. You know, con I think consciousness evolved, but I think that only humans have consciousness. So I'm, we have both of those. It's a long story. But anyway, so, so we have that, that letter building each step. And by the way, can you see the body's coming back to life? Well, again, if you watch God of the Galaxy, there was an image of that as well. But the, the, there was a, 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 a Robbie Williams, this pop star, did this song called uh, Rock, Steady or Rock something, where it was all about being a pop star and everybody wants you. So all these women around him and they grab his clothes and then they start grabbing his flesh until he goes down to just the bare bones. But it wasn't originally him. The, the best version of it, do not watch this, is Martin Scorsese's first movie when he was in, 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 in college, in, in film school, he made a short film, 15 minutes long, even describing it to you will scare you. It's called The Shave. The Shave. And it just shows a man shaving. But he doesn't stop. <laughs> even just describing it to you, that's how good it is. You watch this, I, I know I've forgotten it, I don't know, it was on TV sometime, Whatever, but it's about building. So this is the reverse. It's coming back to life. Well, each stage. Let's keep going. Okay. So I prophesied as I was commanded. So you can see there's a change now. Until now, God's saying what to do. And then, right, it's now, he's telling him what to do, and now he does it. Just like, by the way, in creation, 
God says, I will do this. God said, let us make man an image, and then he does it. Or let me make light, and then he does it. It's two stages. So it's very similar to creation. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Okay, so I love this. As he begins to speak, there's, there's coming alive. The bones start moving together. Go on. And when I looked, behold, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Okay, so even though he's recognizing the change, he's still noticing what isn't there yet. Okay? Yeah, they're coming together, but they're not alive. And then next. Then God said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds of breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Okay, now what's interesting about that verse? In, I asked in, you at the beginning, is this story true? Or is it, uh, an, uh, is it a metaphor? So at the back, you're going to say? It's not God's breath, it's the wind. Good, absolutely. I mean, ultimately the wind comes from God, but it's indirect. But remember, I began and asked you the question is, did this happen? Is this all a vision? Right? But there's a, verb, there's a word in this sentence that makes you think it might be historical. What's the word? Put your, don't shout out, put your hand up if you get the word. What's the word that implies it's got a historical context? Put your hand up. You got, no, don't say it. Just put your hand up. Because educationally, that's the problem, by the way, in schools. You ask a question, the child shouts out, no one else gets it. Right? So now there's called, in education England, there's direct questioning, where you ask each child differently, or you do what I'm doing. You see how many hands, then you know who've got it. So, or they might not have got it. Yeah? Anybody over here? You worked out the word that implies this histor history in this verse? Nine? Any hands? You got? I know you got, but any, over here? You worked it out? What do you think? Over here? What, what do you think the word is? How they, were they were killed. What does it matter what happened to them? Who these people were? If they were slain, you want to know, well, who killed them? Why are they killed? This, this, this gives a ring of truth about it. The Gemara we're going to see, we, we go till after quarter to ten or half nine? What should we do? Quarter to ten. Excellent, fine. Quarter to eleven. <laughs> 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 In English, it's quarter to eight. Yes. No, whatever. Always finish early, that's what I say. Um, right, so the Gemara gets really excited. The Gemara says, is this real or not? Who were the Hawa given? They have a field day. They, have a, they get all excited. Who are the different people that were killed? Anyway, so it says there that they were killed. And he breathed them as they should live. And the next verse. <coughs> so I prophesied as God commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Okay, so they're not just alive, they're like an army now. Mm -hmm. so you've got the word harugim, and you've got the word army, chayal. Right? That implies something quite military or, or quite powerful. It's not just the people alive, they're able to fight. Right? Chayil, right? Eshet Chayil. Right? How do you translate Eshet Chayil? Not good. I know a good translation from John Whistler. She's a real trooper. <laughs> Get that? <laughs> the secret of translation is a word that has the two meanings. Right? See? It's about, but it's a, it, it captures something. Right? Because you get it. But in the Hebrew, if you know Hebrew, you get it. But in translation, woman of valor, woman of worth, it's lost in translation. Right? Remember there was a movie called Lost in Translation. We were living in Israel when it came out. It was called Upadimba Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> right? My wife said, look, it's lost in translation. <laughs> it's about a man in Tokyo. It's unbelievable, literally. <laughs> Israelis don't do irony, so it must be irony. But translation is very So, ruach means also spirit. Yes. And, and the translation doesn't say that. 
Yes, of course it does. It means both. Right? But just like in Genesis chapter 1, the Ruach Elohim Melachefet al Panei Hamayim, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So, does the Spirit of God, is it spiritual? Does it really, is it a wind? Why does it hover if it's really spiritual? So we play with both here. In, in the tradition, it's both. It's not spiritual or physical. That's the big mistake in our Judaism today. People are either physical or spiritual. It's all one. You know, in Kiddush, you take the idea in your hand and you drink it. If you drink it, you don't say the idea, you haven't done Kiddush. If you say it, you don't drink it or eat it, I'm not saying you haven't done Kiddush. It's the unification of the two. I don't believe in higher spiritual levels and no physical levels. I, there's not, there aren't two worlds. There's just one world, and you're in it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I know you understand what I'm trying to say. Because that's, that's what we're talking about. This one world is unified. Spirituality makes you aware of the physical world. It's not a separate world. It makes you more aware of this world. That's the idea. So that's why, for me, Ruach fits between both. But let's keep going, because I'm conscious of time. Next verse. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are doomed. Okay, so now you can see very clearly. He explains the metaphor. Really clearly for him, so he knows. Well, why not just begin here, right? Why do the whole story? Why not just say that, that, that the people are saying our hope is lost? He has to bring it to life. He has to say these bones are the Jewish people, and they're saying Avda Tikvatenu. Sound familiar? This is clearly the key line of this chapter. What's the key line of Kimber's poem? Odlo Avda Tikvatenu. It's exact parallel. Avda Tikvatenu Odlo Avda Tikvatenu. Imba is saying, we're not like them. We have not given up. The secular Zionists, so we don't care. We haven't given up. We're going to go to Israel no matter what. We're going to die in the swamps. Whatever it takes, we're not giving up hope. He's a response to this text. He listens to Yechezkel. He doesn't want to be part of these failed bones. There's nothing more religious than Hatikva. You don't need to make it Jewish. It is Jewish if you only read Yechezkel. And amazingly, you've heard this Haftarah, some of you knew this, but I tell people this, and they go, I never heard And they don't sing Hatikva. As positive as it is, probably it just did it for the random, saying, Odlo Avta is not yet. So it just implies it will come at one point. Right, but it's not. No, no, no. True, no, it's not, it's not lost. As long as. Right. Th that's the point. Yeah, Od Baleva. Yeah, but saying Odlo Avta Tikvatenu. Is not yet, which is a different picture. Yes, no, no, wait, no, 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 he's saying, no, no, no. we still haven't given up. That's what he's yeah. saying. Yeah. We're still on the giving up. We still haven't given up. Unlike those bones that did give up, we are, it's a direct response to the failure of the people in Yechezkel's time, which led to the end of the first state of Israel. He's saying, we never gave up hope. So you see, it's a, clearly his commentary on it. Okay, now let's keep going. <laughs> Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. I mean, there's a great irony, right? Because what happened to Imba? They opened his grave and brought him to Israel. <laughs> Interesting, right? Yeah. But the image here is saying, I'm going to bring you back. Right? There's no more powerful example of redemption than not just coming back to Israel, but coming back to life. Just look at a moment at the, at the, at the, at the picture on the next page. It's a bit of Christianity. I don't know how much Christianity you've had in Minyan Volosofen. It's always a bit of a bit. Um, at the bottom of the picture here, right? The Christians got all some of their best ideas from us. They got the good tunes, but we, we, we got the ideology. Um, the Resurrection by Sir Stanley Spencer, a great English painter. The Resurrection, normally for Christians, means the rising of Jesus Christ, right? And he stands for the redemption and the second coming of, the, of Christianity. 
Their idea of redemption is based on our idea of redemption. We're still waiting, right? By the way, I teach um, in England now to study Jewish studies in school. You have to do, you have to learn about Christianity or another religion as well. It's a new rule. So you can't just study one faith; you have to study two. So all the Christians have decided to learn Judaism, right? The bishop, en masse, made a decision um, that, that, that Christians have to learn about Judaism. So I'm now visiting, uh, teaching uh, Catholics heads of religious Christian schools, all about Judaism. So I go in there with my Sefer Torah, and I explain. And they have to, the exam says, what's the Jewish view of the Messiah? What's the Jewish view of this? And they have to learn it. So we're discussing, they say, what's your opinion on the Messiah? I've got 50 Catholic teachers, I mean, what's your opinion on the Messiah? So I say, let me explain it to you with a joke. I said, it's very simple. When the Messiah comes, because we all believe the Messiah is going to come, you've just got one question to ask him. Have you been here before? <laughs> and if he says yes, then all of us Jews have to rethink. But if he says no, then all of you have to rethink. So they get it. They get it. Okay? So it's an important, important issue, right? But we're still waiting for the return. But remember, the re you think the re when I say the resurrection, you think you Christian. When you hear the word redemption, you think Jewish. But now that you've read Yechezkel, resurrection is Jewish. It's the ultimate redemption. Even that they got from us. And this painting, so Spencer, remember, he's a Christian, but he's English. So he makes everything English. So instead of the resurrection happening in, um, in, uh, in, in Jesus and in Israel, in Bethlehem, it's in the churchyard in Cookham, the village in Berkshire where he lived. He thinks of his own resurrection, of his own country, of his own little village, and the, and, the, and the grave, can you see the grave's open, and everybody gets up, right? When I first saw this painting, I thought of the Valley of Dry Bones. I mean, unknowingly, he's actually doing Yehezkel, right? Which is that we come back to life, the Jews come back to life. Now, let's go back to the text, so we've got to that one. We've got two verses to go. Verse, uh, Yud, Yud Gimel. And you shall know that I am God when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Okay, so you're, there's a, knowing is important, you'll be aware. Last verse, Venatati. Venatati uchibachem, vichitem, vinati etchem al admatchem. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, God, have spoken it and performed it, says God. Okay, so you're gonna, I'm going to put you in your own land. I'm going to make you come alive. It's all just like creation, right? Even putting in your own land is like creation. Anybody know why? Where was Adam made? Where? Now, where was he made? Where was that earth from? Was he in Eden? Read the chapter 2. Go home tonight and read chapter 2. It's not. He took earth, made Adam, made him come alive, and then the Nathi put him in Eden. He wasn't in Eden. Where was he? That's a great question. Another time, right? It's a good question. I read the text very carefully. Read, read slower. Read slower. But it doesn't matter at this point. The, the, the importance here is it's parallel in creation. Right? I'm going to put you in Israel. I put him in Eden. I made him come alive. This is the rebirth. So the rebirth of the Jewish people is the same as the rebirth of creation. Right? It's, it's Bereshit and Shemot and Yechezkel is the same. Bereshit is creation of the, of the world. Shemot is the first creation of the Jewish people. They both have an ark. Right? Tevat Noach, Tevat Moshe. Right? They both come back to life. They have a, there's lots of parallels. I'm sure you've had lecturers do this stuff with you. There's a, a, a rebirth thing going on. So this text is all about the ultimate rebirth of the Jewish people. What's amazing is, and Imba didn't see it, and Yechezkel didn't see it, is that you look at Israel today, it's literally rebirth. On every, a rebirth of a language, that's impossible. Right? Rebirth of the land, reclaiming the swamps, of a culture, startup nation, all these levels. It's a real shock. The only other country that's managed to bring language back to life are the Welsh, right? And when I was in university, I met a Welsh guy, and he was telling me it was an amazing thing. I said, how did you do it? He said, it's very simple. We did the all-pun method. 
He's a Welsh guy, not Jewish. I said, what? I, I studied physics at university. He said, we did the all pun method. What are you talking about? In Wales, they watched what happened in Israel, and they learned that method. They brought over all pun teachers to teach them how do you reteach a living language. Just look it up. Don't, nowadays, just look everything up on the internet. Don't, don't believe me. Don't believe a word I say. I'm a lab. Okay? I'm also a doctor, so maybe you can. But, um, so, but it's an amazing thing. So these are literal rebirths of Israel in, and described originally in this dry bones. And that's what we say at the Cholamite Pesach. But I want to show you, turn over, I want to show you the power of the parallel on page three. I've laid out here very neatly for you the different stages of the rebirth. And unsurprisingly, there are seven. Okay? So you have the dry bones, and the bones are Israel. Noise and shaking, you say to the bones, our hope is lost. The bones join together, God opens the graves. Each one parallels, knowing God is the huge army. Each step in the metaphor builds until you get coming back to life. And you can compare it to the rebirth of Israel today. But the last stage, you get placed in your land, vidatem kiani Hashem, and know that I am God. That stage is lacking. Right? That's being forgotten in Israel. Right? And I don't blame the Chilonim, I blame everybody. <coughs> right? Because, you know, we have the greatest Jewish educators in the world in Israel. And yet, <coughs> for some reason, it's not mixing with the whole country, right? Some people have run away to, to territories and they concentrate on that instead of being in Tel Aviv. What would have happened if all the people, not all, some, the Shtachim were important, Yudav HaShomon, I like that. Yudav HaShomon has to be built, Me'achos, 100%. But what happens if a few of those had gone to Tel Aviv and taught and set up things there? What would have happened then? We, we separated our society out, not healthy. We needed to be integrated. That's the last stage, right? Israel, I'm going to be very challenging. Israel is alive today, but it's not conscious. In a In a Absolutely, it has to be challenged. So, your Mats Mut, this year, six tonight, it's amazing, but we've got to come to life on this. I think we're coming of age, 70 years, maybe it'll take a bit longer, we'll get there. We, got, we, could, we could think in long, long term. You mean your Mats Mut? <laughs> well, it's actually, it's, it's, it's actually Yom Mangal nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Gomorrah, we'll end with this Gomorrah. This Gomorrah has different versions, we'll do it in English because we're, we're, we're short on time. Uh, this Gomorrah has different versions of what was going on in the whole story. Right, but Nehemiah said, Be'emet Mashahaya. Really, the whole thing's a parable. It's not true, none of it happened. It's all an image. I want you to know the Gemara is not afraid to say things didn't literally happen. But there's another opinion. Rabbi Eliezer, son of Yossi Aglili, said, No, who are the dead who Yechezkel revived? Right? They, he said they're real. And they got married and had children. And they went to live in Israel. It really happened. I love that. Very nice ending. So who were they, he says. Who were they? Five theories. Right? Now, by the way, none of these theories they can prove. And this is the deep point of the Shia. I hope you can get it. I'll explain the idea and we'll go through them. I'll say it first so it's clear. When the Gemara lists these stories, it's not trying to give you historical facts. It's trying to teach you about what it takes to be redeemed and who redemption applies to. Right? So I'm going to learn now a lesson from this. I don't treat it as history. I treat it as poetry. It's trying to teach me ideas. I'll explain to you what I mean as we go to each one. So, for example, Rav said, who were they? They were the descendants of Ephraim who calculated the end of the uh, uh, of slavery, but they heard. You know about this? We were told we'd be 400 years in Mitzrayim, in slavery. Some people tried to Hisheva Daket, calculate the end, and left early, and they got killed. Right? They didn't trust to wait for God. They took it by themselves, right? And they got killed. And, and as well, those are the dry bones. That's who it is. So what's the message? Even people who don't listen to God and do it their own way, they also, Shivat Zion applies to them. So sometimes the Datim will say to the Chilonim, you shouldn't have forced God's hand and gone back. Right? God forbid, but there are some Khamedi texts that say the Holocaust is because of the Tzionim. You know that one? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Pardon? Satama, exactly. Right? The Holocaust is because of the Khamenei. It's because of the, uh, the, 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 the Zionists caused it. 
By the way, the Zionists say that the Holocaust, some, some of the Zionists say the Holocaust because of the people that weren't Zionists. So I got my Sachs wrote an essay saying, if I can learn the exact opposite from the same event, then I can learn nothing. Mm -hmm. And the Holocaust is a black hole. It just sucks in. You can't, you can't get past it. You can't learn out of it. You can't get out of a black hole. You can just stand in front of it. You can't learn out of it. It's a very interesting essay he writes about. But anyway, the example there is saying, even the people that didn't listen to God, right? That dry bones, but then what does that mean? They came to life. They're also allowed in Israel. The next room, well, Shmuel, uh, Shmuel says, who does it refer to? These are the people who denied resurrection, right? They said, we don't believe in it. We don't believe that in resurrection of the dead. In the, in the Amida, every day we say, even if you don't believe in it, right, you can come. Right? So there's a famous story about, I think it's about Planck, the scientist Planck. Um, uh, the physicist? Yeah, yeah. So above his door, he had a horseshoe. Yeah. You know the story? Yeah, I know. He had a horseshoe. And his friend said, you're not superstitious. Why do you have your scientist? Why do you have a horseshoe you know, above your door? <coughs> so he said, apparently, whether you, it works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> right? Same here. Right? Even if you don't believe, you're going to be Shivatsiyon. That's what I think the Gemara is trying to teach us. It applies to all of them. The next one. But Vimea said, these are the people who lacked even the moisture of a mitzvah. Everyone of them should Abraham lach luchit shall mitzvah. Lach, lach, right? You know your halacha. Lach luchit means a bit of liquid. A bit of liquid. And then I would say they're so dry. I know some Jews. They are so dry. They're not <laughs> Jewish. And their favorite day is Tisha B'Av. Right? You know, they can't stand it. Right? In English, dry means no whiskey. Right? <laughs> dry means no whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you looking at me? Right? So, by the way, but you notice the imba, the lach, the liquid? Yeah. The liquid is life. And the Gomorrah is sensitive as well. So they don't even have any liquid and they're so dry, there's nothing to them. They're not alive. You need to have the juices flowing, the blood flowing inside you. Right? The tears cry in shul. Cry emotionally when you give a speech. I love a speech at a wedding. You know, if someone doesn't cry, I'm not happy. I want to see, I want to see real tears. Right? And also, I want the Jordan to rise. Right? And the, 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 the rains to all the liquid he's talking about, I want. Right? He talk, talks about this here. Well, Yitzchak says, these were the people who covered the whole temple with pictures of abominations and creeping things. Okay? Now, this is amazing for me, because this is about Chiloni Israel in Yerushalayim. Right? The people who have no respect for the Kotel, they don't know it, but Chiloni, who want to have nightclubs and all this kind of stuff. What does the Gemara say? I think they also, Shivat Zion, come back to life. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. Whoever you are, it applies to all of you. These bones are cold, bet Yisrael. And I mean cold. No matter how bad you think it is. And they think of the most horrific people. The last one is about um, Nebuchadnezzar set up his idol in Dua. And people trampled each other trying to worship it. It's like the horrible, most evil, idolaters, violent people. Anybody, everybody makes it back to Israel. Even Chilonim, even Chalim in prison, right, for not giving the wife a gift. Just whatever, I'm just saying, whatever group you don't like, right, they're also Shivatiyon. Right? But my sacks would always say, if your answer to the question about Judaism doesn't relate to all the Jewish people, all of them, then it's not an answer. It's got to include everybody. And I'm showing you here, but why the Gemara tells the story that I could learn from this that it's saying all of them count. So it's cold, bitch, you said, it's everybody. And Imba, a modern Jew, naturally knows Yechezkel, but I'll bet. And he writes a poem quoting from all over Tanakh, and you, you only get it if you know the references, right? You ever read of Eva Zornberg? Right? You read a paragraph and you go, oh, I get that reference. And you think, how many did I miss in the last paragraph? If I only got that one, right? Referencing. In movies today, by the way, they reference other movies. That's what you do, right? So the Tanakh, a writer today references uh, uh, the, the perfect example of this. He got a Nobel Prize. Agnon got a Nobel Prize for his writings. Uh, he is hinting to loads of Tanakh. You can buy an Agnon today with lots of references of what he's referring to. But you have to know Tanakh. Right? And the Datiyim and the Chilonim don't know Tanakh. But who, would, who would welcome Imba today? <coughs> right? Except the university. But that's the point. He understood it and it all came together. I want to finish off 
And the last page was a picture of plants. Right? This was a, an episode. I got so excited. Um, I don't know if he's famous here. Have you heard of um, David Attenborough? Yeah. He does these uh, nature programs, wonderful nature programs. And a few years ago, he did one on Africa. And each chapter was a different part of Africa. And one was about the Sahara Desert. Wonderful episode, really exciting. And there's one bit where he talks about the resurrection plant, and they show it. This plant, the middle of nowhere, right? And it grows in a bit of water, and the water runs out, and it just dies for years, right? And then it breaks away from the ground, and it's dead, completely dead, and it rolls. And eventually lands, years later, where there's a puddle, and then it grows again. Unbelievable. It looks like it's dead, and they call it the resurrection plant. These are polypoikilohydric po plants that can survive extreme dehydration even over months or years. Some are, um, sorry, have been have been sold in uh, uh, so some have been long sold in their dry, lifeless forms, curiosities. So you sell them dry, and then you add water, and they grow. The Israeli Persian buttercup, native to Israel, is a survivor wildflower that thrive under the dry, harsh conditions. Right? That is the Jewish people. Right? We look almost dead. You add a bit of water, it comes back to life. You take a little Jewish community, almost dead. You add water, you know, some exciting rabbi comes to the community, or a new program, and suddenly it comes back to life. And, and you, all your calculations don't work. That's what we are. We are dry bones coming back to life. So when you sing Hatikvah, you are quoting, without realizing it, Imba, 150 years ago, all the way to Yecheskel, and you're saying to Hashem, I still read Tanakh, I still visit the Avot, Odlo Avda Tikvatein. It's very powerful when you know the huge history behind it. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got two minutes for questions, or what should we end in? Small question, yeah? I'm shocked by his knowledge and his level of Hebrew. I, I find it amazing. Was that unique or was that... It, it was the educated class, Zionists, but he, and he had a religious background. But Ben Gurion, every week, had a Tanakh class. Right? They knew their Tanakh. It was very important to them. Well, my, my, no, that's a poet. My, my father is a Temani Jew, Yemenite Jew. Uh, brought up, his family aren't religious, but they all know Tanakh by heart. I didn't used to believe my father, so I'd sit on Seder night and I'd say, okay. And I'd read a puzzle and he'd just keep going. Right? Because it was inside them, it was their language. My friend Johnny Reinhardt, we grew up together, he's now a professor in Barilan in politics tenure, but he was a big fan of the Beatles. And he can sing any Beatles song, right? I, if I started some Beatles songs to you, right, you'd know what to do. Yesterday, all my troubles. You, you know what to say, because you know. They're all in your head, because you sing them. So there was a time we used to sing Torah and Tanakh. And we knew it. It was our phraseology, right? So there were others who also wrote the Absolutely. Poetry? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of And you heard Halevi in the medieval period wrote poetry on these kind of issues of Tanakh, because it was our Shakespeare, Nahavdil. Right? But it was, it was our, and we could quote it, and it was, it was what you knew. But it, it's not just reading it, it's reading it over and over and being comfortable with it. So in, I remember in the, um, in, the, uh, in the first intifada, in the, in the first, in the Lebanon war, right? And this, remember this, there were missiles, there were scuds shooting them down. So my father said, Right, God will fight for you and you'll be saved. Right? You know, there's, there's a, and I always, as a child, always wanted to be able to quote Tanakh. You see Rabbanim who are great, they just give you Pesukim all over the place. And as a kid I used to think, are oh, they just showing off? <coughs> but what's happening is that a Mayana Mitgaber, it's flowing out of them. It, I'll finish with this, because here's my theory of davening. You know, lots of prayers go from Aleph to Taf. You know, on Shana, another prayer, Aleph to Taf. And it's over and over, and it's repetitive in English. It's like, God, you are so wonderful. God, you are so great. You're really brilliant and big. Now, why is it repetitive? I think it's meant to be this is my idea, my way of looking at it, is um, something you live with. You know in, when you're cooking, you have a back burner. You cook something, you put it on the back burner. Or in, in the computers, you have a subroutine. The 
is running in the background. I think davening is about teaching us to have the words of God and Hebrew in our heads in the background that can't leave. So we go aleph to tough. We say the whole thing. So we've expressed ourselves, and it, and it keeps ringing in our ears. Do you ever have that? A song in the morning, you hear a song, you can't get it out of your head? It's called an earworm. Mm-hmm. Gets in there. Davening and Tanakh is meant to be inside us. Right? And what we used to learn by heart, rhetoric, and look at the old way the Greeks used to speak and teach. You used to have to know a lot by heart. And people today say, oh, who needs to learn by heart? Just read it. Knowing by heart isn't about being able to say it publicly. It's about it rolling around your head. And it changes who you are. And we're losing that. So I try and learn things by heart, not to be this, but to, to get inside me. I'm very good at pop songs, right? And, and film scenes. And Tanakh, the more you read it, you begin to learn the Pusukim and you see them over and over again and they come alive. What love that